This morning we're going to look at a passage that uh, it's John chapter 8, and it is uh, more known as the adulterous woman. Happy Memorial Day, right? So uh, why this passage? Well, it, it's an interesting passage, and it has have to start that there are some uh, difficulties with the passage itself. If you uh, look in your Bible, probably chapter 7, verse 53 is either where it starts, um, or some will lump it right at 8-1, uh, and you may see some brackets around it. It's set apart as that this passage was not in some of the original and best manuscripts that we have, from the oldest uh, uh, documents that we have. Uh, and so there are questions as to when was it added, uh, should it have been added, um, and then through history and, and, and some of the early stages, it had been placed in a few different spots, uh, but at uh, some point was placed here. And, and so with that, questions of, of when was it written? Did John write it? Uh, what, what happened? Uh, the textual questions are not anything that uh, changes any doctrine or any truths. And in fact, I believe that this passage and this story that's here was uh, historical. It's something that happened. And so as it goes in, has been put in here, uh, depending on the translation, if you have a new, uh, like a King James, uh, because it was translated from uh, the Vulgate or the Latin version, uh, it, was, it was always in there. And so, like I said, there are some issues. If you ever want to have a coffee over it, we can talk about it. But uh, looking at this, it is something that highlights the truths we know of Christ, of His interactions, of the situations that were going on, and so um, hold this to be something that uh, I do that happened uh, historically. It is John chapter 8, 1 through 11, and it's the story of uh, the adulterous woman. As we look at it, Jesus, in its placement here in the text, right beforehand in chapter 7, uh, it had just finished the Feast of Booths, which was uh, a ceremony or the uh, festival that the Jews had commemorating their time in the wilderness. And Jesus, uh, they were his family, which didn't really believe him, some of his brothers said, you need to go to Jerusalem uh, during this time so that people will see that you're uh, the Christ. And they kind of said this in disbelief, and he said, it's not yet time because he knew uh, the struggles that would take place in Jerusalem. This takes place in the fall, and it's probably uh, the fall which in a few months would be the Passover in which he rode triumphantly uh, into Jerusalem and then killed at the end of that week. And so it's just a few months prior to that. Uh, he wasn't going to go up there, and he told them, go on without me. He hung back, and in midweek he shows up at the festival and he starts teaching. Uh, and their maze is wisdom for someone who hasn't been schooled like the Pharisees and all that. His teaching, where is he getting this? Isn't he just a Galilean? And there's this division. And the Pharisees have already felt the, the threats. They've been threatened in their power by him, and they're seeking to kill him. And he challenges them, even through uh, looking at the law of Moses, bringing up uh, why he should heal somebody. And then he brings up that circumcision is done. Even if it falls on the Sabbath, you would allow that for a child. So why not make someone whole and well? Uh, but it was the way the Pharisees and the religious leaders were trying to get at him for anything they could that would be wrong. And so this ends, uh, and then Jesus, uh, he'd been teaching, and they were amazed. But then it says in uh, verse 1, we look at the first part here, verse 1 through 4, and we look at a, a section here where a woman is caught. And it said, They went each to his own house, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. He would go there and sleep. Uh, he was kind of nomadic. Remember, the Son of Man had no place to lay his head. Foxes have holes and the birds have nests. He would find himself, he would go to the Mount of Olives, um, where they would basically industrial area, a garden, take the olives. There was presses and things there that would make olive oil and all that, but he would go into that garden 
And he'd spend the night. And so he goes there, and then he comes back. And it says, early in the morning, he came again to the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and placing her in, his, in, his, in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. So they brought this woman. He's back at the temple. He's teaching. And all of a sudden, the scribes and the Pharisees, they bring this woman. It's early in the morning, and there's something going on here. The festival has just ended, but he's still there. There's a lot of people still around, no doubt, that have not just left town yet. And especially with him having been such a draw, they are there to listen. But the scribes and the Pharisees bring this woman to him. Now, immediately there's a lot of questions that should surround this because here we are, someone who they have caught, they have seized, they're bringing for trial, pretty much. You think, well, what should go on legally in this? Well, they should take her to the Sanhedrin to go under trial. But they're bringing her to him uh, because he's out in public, and we're going to find out later they've got ulterior motives in doing so. So who is this woman? We don't know. We have no idea. There's uh, no name given. There's no association of who she is. Um, but they bring her, and, and the scribes and the Pharisees have already uh, had it out for Jesus, seeking to kill him, which he confronted in chapter 7 and brought it out to light. And so they're bringing to him this woman. Now, this crime that they seize her in, and I'm being very judicious here this morning as we talk about, but... Uh, uh, to bring her alone is not part of the protocol that they should be going through in uh, bringing about justice. They bring her by herself. She was not by herself. There's another party involved. And the Bible says both should be brought. So something's not going right. Something's fishy about what's happening here. Things are not being uh, followed as they should because there's an issue going on. Um, it's, it's a mob mentality in a sense. They're out for a lynching. They are out for a, a purpose here. Something's not right. There's a, a, a F.B. Meyer a commentator said, it is a terrible thing for a sinner to fall into the hands of his fellow sinners. Because even though they may have caught her in sin, this is a mob mentality that is out against Jesus, and right now she's a pawn in their scheme. They bring her. There's a crowd gathered, and they bring her to him. And so then they, they, they lay this trap. In verse 5 and 6, it says that they had caught her in the act, and, and they said, Now, um, teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now, in the law of Moses, uh, the law of Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? And this they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. Side note, this says this is the reason they're really here. Are they out for justice? Are they just out looking to see what's wrong in the world? And we're going to take care of it? No, something's not right. They're out to test him. So there's thoughts, this is, a, this is a trial for him. They're trying to find him and catch him in a situation where he can misspeak and they can turn on him and get him. In the meanwhile, this woman is brought out. The man is not. This is not correct. They should both be brought out by uh, law. In Deuteronomy 22, uh, explains what should happen. It should be credible witnesses. This is not something that would have happened out in the open, in the public. This was something that would have been very private. And for them to have found uh, this woman and have been true eyewitnesses, something's not right there. Some have said that this is probably a setup and that this man who uh, should have been brought out, who's involved, was either allowed to escape 
uh, or that he was even part of the setup, uh, or uh, that he might have even escaped after that, or he was in the group there that was coming forward. Uh, we don't know. Nothing is said about him except that he's absent in the text. And so something is not right. It's not following protocol. They're bringing it out. They're not going quietly to the Sanhedrin. They're coming in public to Jesus, and it says they are there to test him. And they said the law of Moses, specifically uh, Leviticus 20.10 and Deuteronomy 22.22, said both parties, if guilty, to be brought out, would be put to death. They're just bringing one, and they're asking him, the law says she should be stoned. And then they say, what do you say? The test here for Jesus in trying to trick him is that if he says, yes, she should be stoned, I agree with the law of Moses, then he would get, go against the law of Rome. See, the Jews did not have the right to capital punishment. Um, and if you think about like Pilate uh, had to agree to Jesus' uh, Jesus's crucifixion. Uh, they could not just kill Jesus. They had to get Roman authority behind it. There are mob mentalities where there were stonings, sometimes off in uh, remote areas. Um, you know, there were times where Jesus, they were going to approach him, and he slipped away, even uh, up in Galilee uh, early on. There uh, are times where, but, uh, where it almost they act, but it's not something that could be owned by the Sanhedrin or the religious leaders. It's kind of like, oh, a rogue group got somebody. Uh, but this, in the public... If Jesus says yes, stoned, then uh, he, he is in the public making a decision that would lead and he would be culpable. And so they're trying to trick him on that. If he says, no, she should not be stoned, then he goes against the law of Moses. Think about how many times they try to come up to Jesus to trick him. This is one instance. You think about others. Is it, is it lawful to pay taxes to Rome. And what happened? They're coming at him and Jesus answers them. He's too good. If you guys, uh, Mike Tyson, heavyweight fighter years ago, if you're young, uh, was almost invincible for a while. And uh, before fighting Evander Holyfield, they said, are you nervous uh, that, you know, about fighting him? And he said, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. They're all ready to go. The Pharisees and the scribes have a plan. They're going to trick Jesus. And in a sense, they're just about to get punched in the mouth. He's too good. And so they bring this to him, hoping to trick him, to get him to choose one side or the other, and then he'd be exposed uh, for one way or another. And they set it to test him. And then Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and he said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones, and Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. They come to him, they ask this question, and he's standing there, and the woman's standing there. All of a sudden, Jesus, he bends down, and he starts riding in the sand, on the ground, the dust. And he's riding, and we're always wondering, what did he write? Commentators have tried to figure out speculations, what was it that he wrote? Some have thought, ah, he was maybe writing down the law, the Ten Commandments, uh, and writing that down. Maybe uh, he was writing something out of uh, Deuteronomy, another part of the law where they were uh, improper witnesses. They weren't going about like they should have. Maybe he was writing their names. We don't know. But it mentions it, and there's something that's kind of sleight of hand about it in a way that's kind of like distraction. All of a sudden, the focus is not on her. There's something 
almost uh, establishing some dignity for the woman as he bends down and starts writing, and they're waiting to hear. Where's the focus now? What's he writing? What's his answer going to be? And they press him more. What is his? And they, they pressed him more. And he doesn't say a word, but he's writing. We don't know what he wrote, but I think he genuinely, either it was something they could read and recognize, or for whatever reason, it took the focus off of her. And then as he said, then he who is without sin may cast the first stone. He didn't dismiss what she had done as whether or not she's guilty or not. But as far as the punishment, he said, whoever's without sin, be the first at it. Those who were accusers or witnesses by law were to be the first ones to throw stones. And so Jesus throws it out there for them. But in doing so, I think the distraction takes away from her, it brings it to something else. It brings it away from her, and as he answers them, whatever it was, it put it on them, that then each one of them left, the oldest, the older ones going first. My, uh, one of my mentors, and uh, Keith Chancy, who taught me a ton about youth ministry, and when I came into Denton, uh, he used this, in a sense, in counseling people, because there's always an issue, but too often we make it such a personal thing that gets in the way of getting this issue. And he would just kind of write on his hand just as talking with somebody and say, so what's the, what, what, what's, what is our issue here? What is, and kind of get it out here. And almost like write with his hand. Just kind of following this. And it was amazing because whether you're on the receiving end or trying to talk through something or if it was something that was... Uh, you know, really deep with a student or a leader or whatever, working through some issue, it took it off of, what have you done, you, and said, what is the thing we're dealing with? Whether it be a sin, whether it be whatever it is, let's deal with this. And it, it was almost genius, but it was taking from this as a, as a method. I think it was a way to take the, the, the focus off of her put this onto what's going on here, and whatever it is he wrote, they took it to heart, and they dropped it. Who went first? Who were the ones to leave first? The older ones. Why is that? Well, the older ones, and maybe in here we can affirm it, are usually more aware and self-aware of their life. You know what you've done wrong. You know you're not perfect. Those who are younger tend to be a little more brazen, kind of unaware. Or if you're a younger Christian, what do you focus on a lot of times? You're focused on the biggies. You know, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. In seminary, one of our professors said, it was, seems our job as students sometimes is to avoid the major sins and hide the minor ones. Young Christians will avoid the major ones. Yeah, all right, I got to give up cussing and drinking and you name it, whatever. Those things we don't name or what, you know. You get older and you begin to find a lot of other dirt, motives, the heart behind why you do what you do. You're like, gosh, even when I'm doing good things, I'm doing it for me. I'm doing it so I'll be recognized. You get a little older, you wear that your heart is not so pure. Oh, maybe you're not doing these big things, but you know your life still is full of sin. And as Jesus says, you who are without sin, not necessarily meaning perfect, or else, you know, the law, you could never have charged anyone with anything, but in this instance, he throws it back, probably uh, calling to light their hypocrisy as they come at her with a charge trying to get him in a trap. And then he writes, and he turns it back on them. How pure are you? And if you are pure, throw the first stone. And it pierces them. And I'm sure the older ones are the first one to kind of back off, look around at the others. Anyone else going to take the first shot? 
they drop it. There's a few young bucks left. Well, I guess we'll drop it too. The stones are all thrown away. And Jesus, he had knelt down and written again, and they all left one by one, beginning with the older. And then Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. So you have this woman caught, you have this trap that was laid, you have this challenge that's made, and they fail on it. Um, But then you have a pardon that's given. And so Jesus, he stood up, uh, or he's, excuse me, they went away with the older, here we are, and then Jesus stood up and said to her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? He was kneeling down. He stood up to her to be eye to eye with her. He had already taken the distraction, the focus off of her. He had dismissed these, uh, those who would be wanting to stone her, her accusers. And now they're gone. And there still is the crowd who had been there to hear him teach. But he stands up to look at her eye to eye and says, has no one condemned you? And notice what she says. No one, Lord. When the Pharisees and the scribes came to him, they came to him, called him teacher or rabbi. This woman who was supposedly caught in the greater sin and whose now accusers are gone and she's left there, says, no one, Lord. There's an acknowledgement far greater than just teacher. Her heart, something is uh, changing. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go, and from uh, now on, sin no more. Could he have? Being God, could he have uh, condemned her? Because of sin? Yep. Could he have called it out? But as we've seen in the last few weeks, what is the heart of God? As Jesus spoke the parables, to seek and save the lost. It's the sick that need the doctor. The prodigal who took all of his inheritance and went and squandered it. And the love of the Father waits, waits, looking for the son to come back and embraces and throws a feast. This woman in her her shame and her guilt, whether or not she's been set up or not, she's guilty. But before the son of God, she is set free. Later in chapter 8, verse 36 says, So if the son of God sets you free, you will be free indeed. Galatians 6.1, it is for freedom that Christ set us free, that we'd not be a slave uh, to sin and under the bond of slavery. And right before the Son of God, who gives her dignity and says, neither do I condemn you, but go and sin no more. Did he say, Quit sinning, and then I won't condemn you? No. We often act that way in our life, though. Man, if I just get this stuff together, I'll get right before God because I'll do right before God, and then I'll be accepted. He says, no. The the motive of love and forgiveness brings such a security when it is embraced that he who is... Forgiven much, loves much. And so this woman is set free. And we all love this story. We're like, yes, the love of God, the grace, the forgiveness of God. But thinking through our daily lives, in your heart this morning, in your heart when you leave, when you go out, you might be one who identifies with the woman. You might be in a place 
your life is just a bastion of compromise. You constantly struggle and fall short because you're living it on your own. And yet, praying that the grace of God and that love and that forgiveness would pierce your heart, that you would receive that. Perhaps you've been in that place where you're like, I have my past and I cannot get past it. It continues to haunt me. It's the scarlet letter that I wear all around, hoping no one will truly know and see. Because why? Fellow sinners are rough. It's like being out on a third grade playground. You ever been out there and watch kids? They're mean. We're just adult kids. Sometimes our meanness takes different shapes. We might be polite enough not to say it to someone's face. We just speak behind their back. We'll condemn them in other ways. They'll, fear, they'll feel the stare of the eyes. but They will not feel the warmth of forgiveness. Maybe you're like the Pharisees. You are judgmental. You have ulterior motives. You're ready to pounce on injustice, but it's really for your own desires. You have a hard time letting someone get off because if you do let them off, then we're just going to have sin rampant everywhere. And so we got to deal with this stuff. Yes, we take sin serious. We should. But we take people more serious. There are hearts, there are lives that are involved Anyone caught in a sin, what does uh, Galatians say? You who are spiritual, go to them to restore them in gentleness and humility. There is a desire for people to come back. Sometimes our hearts aren't that way. We're like the Pharisees. We love the story, but you know what I wonder about? How many of you guys remember... Um, the rest of the story. The radio, Paul Harvey. It was always amazing because, you know, you get these things and you find out someone's background and then, you know, what the rest of the story would lead and then you'd reveal the person and you're like, oh, wow. For this lady, this woman, she's set free. What happens right after that? The crowds were all around. How does she walk off? Still probably perplexed. It's been a very eventful morning, to say the least. Everything has changed. She's been on death row, and she's just been set free. At some point, she's got to make her way back home. The next day, she's got to make her way to the market. The next week, she's got to do life. Those who are around, those in Jerusalem who know her, what is their attitude? Those that saw the Son of God set her free, do they set her free? Or is she judged? Is she scorned? Are the kids kept away? Those that the Son of God sets free, do we continue to condemn? Or do we come out and we embrace them? Welcome back. Those who have been scorned and guilty, are they free to come back? Do they feel welcome in this room? I hope you do if you are one. Because we all are one. Every one of us the things in our life. And those of us who are older, as I said before, we're more aware of it. The older ones are more aware of it. But that's the process. As Christ renews our hearts, that we see that amazing grace, the love of God that we sing about. And not only are we set free, but to those who are hurting or in sin or who have repented, we set them free. beautiful, wonderful grace of God. 
that's personified right here in this, in this story. We've seen it in the parables. We see it in other aspects. And yet Jesus, as He sets her free, and many would cry for justice in a few months, that justice will take place. Because Christ will come. And He who knew no sin will become sin. So that those who trust and believe in Him in Him and become the righteousness of God. In a few months, in this very city, He will make the payment for her sin and for everyone else, for the Pharisees, the scribes, for you and for me. It will be paid for. But it's been paid for by Christ.